and rolling. And welcome, everybody. My name is Goff Blacksburg. I am the community director at Wolf Financial, also known as the Wolf App. And you can check that out. That's in our bio if you're interested. During this space, I highly recommend whenever a speaker goes to speak that you click into their bio, check out a little bit about what they do. Um, we got a wide range and a diverse panel of speakers up here, um, all people that, you know, I really do respect everything that they're doing. So with that being said, uh, the impetus for the space was actually Brock reaching out to me, wanted to talk about, you know, doing a space about real estate, getting exposure to real estate, some of the real estate stocks. So I think we're going to come at this from a couple of different angles. Uh, but Brock, I wanted to go to you first for, you know, your I idea, you know, what you've been looking at in real estate. And then after Brock, I'm going to roll over um, to either Tyler or Chris. Tyler, I know that you're on limited time, so just let me know how that's going for you. And we'll just kind of keep the ball rolling. And then once we kind of made our way out through the panel, made our way through the panel, we'll just use the raise hand feature, which is inside the spaces. So if you hit that heart, you can use the raise hand, and we'll just use that to move around. Uh, that's enough talking for me. Brock, the floor is yours. Hey, yeah, thanks for having me here on The Wolf. Is my sound all right? Yep, loud and clear. Okay, great. Yeah, hey, everyone. Um, and for those of you that um, may or may not have identified um, that my Twitter handle was recently adjusted, um, I was a personal finance kind of anonymous account for the last couple of years, uh, Biz of Wealth. And so uh, have recently identified my personal, uh, you know, career more tightly with uh, my Twitter, and that is in the real estate industry. And so going a little deeper into it than usual um, on Twitter and in general. So I have uh, worked and partnered with a lot of different parts of the residential real estate industry, um, have gone through some different personal real estate investments, including uh, house hacking, which is a pretty popular idea on, uh, you know, personal finance blogging, personal finance, Twitter, uh, money, Twitter, um, as a way to make your first real estate investment. So I can certainly break that down, but I know we're bringing on some other people here that are um, either pretty sophisticated investors in real estate stocks um, and or pretty sophisticated investors in uh, investing personally into real estate rentals. Uh, I know Tyler, for example, I invited up here who has been uh, doing that and building a brand around that for a while. So I was hoping, you know, we could just kind of parse out something a little bit different than I've seen on on most of the, uh, you know, very stock focused um, and uh you know, a little more industry agnostic conversations that that tend to happen on here and, you know, talk about all the ways to invest in real estate. So, you know, I'll just give a quick rundown of what some of those are. You can personally invest in single family properties. Uh, you can invest in your own or other people's deals to buy apartment buildings. You can um, invest in, you know, residential or commercial real estate stocks. Um, and then ultimately, you can also invest in all kinds of different funds that, uh, that own different types of real estate, you know, so th there's some popular high yield stocks um, that I'm sure we can go through uh, that do things like own cell phone towers or own hospitals or own, um, you know, commercial um, leasing space. And so, you know, there's just so many different angles here and I've been uh, fortunate between my career and my investing to see a few of them. And I know other people have gone a lot deeper on them. So, you know, I just thought it would be a fun way to say, you know, what are all the different ways you can invest in real estate? And let's bring in people that can talk about a bunch of them. Perfect. I think that's a great way to get it started. Um, do you mind if I run to some of these other speakers and kind of get initial thoughts? Or was there a specific question or topic you wanted to approach with? I mean, I think the thing to lead with is just hearing, um, you know, the different types of exposure um, either intellectually or, or even better financially um, that the different speakers have to real estate. So, uh, I'll start by saying I uh, used to be an executive at, at Rocket, so have a lot of exposure um, purchased and, you know, that I earned from working there. Uh, with Rocket, I've been a longtime holder of a lot of residential real estate stocks like Realogy, for example, is one of the biggest. And uh, other than that, have uh, bought and sold different real estate around the U.S. a couple different times. Uh, per personally, and uh, I'm looking to get into more types of uh, multifamily real estate deals, but I've not done it yet. So real estate, I always feel like I get a comment from you about the triple net leases. <laughs> so I would love to hear maybe, you know, some background for you about how you got into real estate, what your exposure is, and then, you know, obviously a little bit on the triple net. Sure. So kind of just give an introduction, everybody. I think most people know me on Twitter more from a financial stock standpoint. 
And over the last couple of years, I've talked about real estate a little bit more, but going back a little bit deeper, I started out as an architect originally, and I focused more on commercial corporate interiors work. And I actually started my career doing historic preservation work, uh, mostly in Manhattan. And uh, what I do now is more as an owner's rep. I work for an independent consultancy that really kind of aligns ourselves with Fortune 500 companies, small and mid-sized type businesses that have a lease anywhere from seven to 10 years, as much as 15 years, and either they're uh, upsize and downsize and moving from one part of a city to another, maybe moving to a completely different city altogether. Um, so day to day, I focus on specifically project management, program management, development management. A lot of times we'll take a client that's looking at maybe just a pile of dirt somewhere, a greenfield site, and, and they want to do um, some due diligence as far as site criteria. They want to look into site evaluation, zoning, entitlements, easements. How do the utilities run to the site? Or how are we going to get our permits? What type of permits do we need? Um, what are the environmental requirements or restrictions that we have? And then what we do is they'll hire us and we'll start to assemble a team for the actual client themselves and say, okay, let's let's get an architect on board. Let's get a civil engineer on board. Um, let's get maybe an MEP engineer on board if there's actual physical structures on the site. And let's let's start to do some conceptual design. Let's, let's do some test fits as far as what we think is going to work. Um, how are we going to purchase the property? How are we going to line up financing? Um, uh, if there's a landlord that or a building or a, a landowner that already owns the land, how is there, do we want to own it? Do we want to lease it? Is it going to be a work letter? So long story short, what we'll do is we'll, we'll start with that due diligence up front and then essentially move into what's called project feasibility and uh, start to kind of identify what do we know, what's actionable, what are the highest risks for kind of going down this road of, of maybe acquiring this property. Um, and then from there, we're going to development management and then ultimately going into the project management. So how does that all tie into triple net? It's that's what I do professionally, more on the corporate side and, and, and higher end commercial side. So we're talking projects that can range anywhere from ten million dollars to the hundreds of millions of dollars. Not stuff that I'm going to buy personally, but over the years I've owned residential property, in my own personal portfolio, my wife and I, and we've rented those out. We've had income, and I just like the tangible asset of owning real estate a little bit more so than just owning stock. Um, and I was introduced into triple net properties. Essentially, triple net property is you're buying the land itself. And you own the building structure if there is a structure on that piece of property um, at the time when you buy it. And then the tenant comes in and they take care of everything. They take care of the maintenance of the building. They take care of the insurance. They take care of the taxes. They pay everything and take care of all those empties in that triple net um, agreement. And then they cut you a check for lease in the actual space. Specific to triple net, I like to focus on um, quick serve restaurants. So think Burger King, think Starbucks, think Dunkin' Donuts. Essentially, if you go in and you buy a piece of property, and let's just say for argument's sake, it costs you a million dollars. We'll keep the number simple. And you got a cap cap rate of roughly 5%. You're going to get roughly 5% return on your dollars if you were to buy that piece of property in cash at that point. So, well, 5% is not a lot. It's two things that come to mind. You're going to make a guaranteed 5% um, from that tenant being in that space. And some of them are corporate back. So, for example, if a Dunkin' Donuts leases a space and the um, franchisee actually goes out of business, sometimes the corporate entity will guarantee the spot and put in another franchisee to continue to rent that space so you're not losing that income from a triple net standpoint and you're making that 5% um, year over year. In addition, you're also getting appreciation on the property itself. Why do I like it? Because as I did residential over the years, I, I don't like to manage my property. I don't like dealing with tenants. I don't like dealing with leaky toilets or, or the roof is, is, is it needs to be replaced, whatever it may be. I want the tenant to actually deal with it and I just want to kind of collect the check and own the property itself. Um, so I know I spit a lot out there, but it's, it's, it's a part of the industry I like that's kind of hands off. It's, 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 it's more of a passive income in the real estate world where you, know, you buy the property, you own the property, you make sure your tenant is servicing it, and you collect your check monthly. And, and, and that's what I love about it. Yeah, it certainly seems to be much less of a headache compared to some of the other styles of you know, being a landlord, dealing with you know, your tenant's problems. Um, what's the trade off from a financial perspective? Because obviously, you know, dealing with less problems, you would think you're probably bringing in less money. Um, right. So what's kind of like the risk reward? So it's it's a little bit the the, the actual lease agreement itself is sometimes and I mean, most often more favorable for the tenant meaning they're going to get it a little bit at a better rate than if if you as the landlord was taking care of a lot of those other things like insurance like building maintenance or more of that 
riskless um, income from that particular tenant, but you're giving up maybe a few points because they're taking care of everything else at that point. Um, but mine's more about the passive aspect. I, I'm, I'm doing the trade-off because I don't want to deal with the property and I can own the properties in other parts of the country. They don't have to be in my backyard here in New Jersey. For example, if I want to buy a Starbucks, a, a property that has a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts, you could be looking at two, three, four million dollars here in Jersey. I can go down south to maybe Georgia. I can maybe go out to Tennessee. I can go out to Ohio. And I can pick up similar properties maybe for a million, a million and a half, which is a little bit more affordable and then start to kind of rack up that portfolio. The goal ultimately in owning triple nets is to build a cash flow. So when I get into my later years, maybe it's 20, 25, $30,000 a month or more that are coming in from the properties that I've accumulated over the previous 20 years or so. Perfect. I, I appreciate the insight there into that. Um, I am going to keep the ball rolling to get hear from a couple of his other speakers. I think the next topic, once we get some, you know, introspective perspectives and a little bit of that, we'll maybe go into more about the pricing and macro situation in this. Um, for right now, Tyler, I want to go to you and maybe you can explain to people a little bit about what you're doing in the real estate industry as it's kind of a, a bit unique compared to what a lot of people are used to. Right. Well, um, I appreciate you guys having me on. Tyler, oh, for those that don't know me. So, so, um, <laughs> Sorry, there's two Tyler. Oh, okay. There's two Tylers. I see three uh, Tylers. That is my mistake. <laughs> there's three Tylers. All right, I totally messed it up. All right, um, I'm going first to uh, Tyler Schwartz, and then I will go to the other Tylers. Apologies. No worries. Sorry, other Tylers. Um, what's going on, everyone? My name is Tyler. Uh, I guess Tyler two or three or one, however you want to put it. Um, I work at Lex. We're a commercial real estate securities marketplace. We're allowing individuals with as little as $250 the ability to get into class A stabilized high quality traditional real estate assets uh, that they typically wouldn't have exposure to. What I mean by that is I'm sitting in New York right now. I'm a 27 year old in New York and I'm looking outside on my balcony. I see all these awesome commercial assets. I have no idea how I would be able to get into owning an individual asset on my block, right? It's very difficult unless you have a ton of money or you have uh, connections or, uh, I mean, it would take a lot of different factors for you to actually own and invest one of these buildings. Um, with Lex, you can buy into one of these assets for as little as $250. What we do is we conduct se uh, Regulation A secondary offerings um, and people, we basically IPO buildings, which is pretty exciting. We allow people to invest with, with as little as $250 and our assets are actually QCIPT. So I know we talked a little bit about stocks and real estate stocks. We're actually creating single asset stocks of real estate and people can own it and hold it in their brokerage accounts. So um, it has a little synergy with the, the FinTech apps like Wolf and other assets, uh, other apps like Public or even your Charles Schwab account, uh, which is super exciting and is allowing anyone to invest. So that's what we're doing. It's, it's a really interesting time and space for us. We actually have an upcoming IPO in the next couple of weeks, which is really, really exciting and why my time is a little limited because I'm putting out fires left and right. We're an early stage startup, but that's what we're working on. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about real estate investing. And I didn't go too deep because I don't have much time, but that's what we're working on. And I would love to talk to any of you. You can DM me and we can talk about real estate investing one-on-one -on -one or Gov. Uh, if you have any other questions about what we're doing at Lex, happy to answer them. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, Lex came into this industry at an interesting time as we had a massive run-up, you know, in real estate prices over the past year. Has that brought more popularity to your space? Has it made it, you know, harder to purchase buildings? What's that look like? You cut out at the beginning for me. Sorry, sorry. So just to repeat, there's been a massive run-up in the real estate industry over the past year, uh, especially in prices um, and popularity. So how has it been building Lex during that time period? Um, did it work better for you that there was this massive surge? Was it I got big into Twitter? So um, this is probably my first my first spaces. But um, you know what I do is from a real estate perspective is I started buying real estate. Uh, three or four years ago now, um, I bought a primary home and then I bought um, a triplex. And then I basically took those two and, and kind of the kind of, I guess what it's called the Burr strategy um, for those that are familiar and we can, you know, maybe go in uh, a little bit deeper and, you know, at another time. But uh, basically I took the, the money from that triplex and have having had it appreciate um, in addition to my primary home. And I was able to take money out to go then buy, um, a, a quadplex. And then, so basically the idea is you buy it, you fix it up or rehab it. 
um, and then you rent it out to a tenant and then you go to the bank having a higher um, you know, appraisal price now and then you're able to kind of refinance it. And the goal is to get all your money back out so that you can go and kind of repeat the process, um, which is the, the burr, right? So buy, um, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. So it's an acronym, but um, that's kind of how I got started. Um, obviously now I, I you know, run my account. I kind of show you know, people how to buy their first uh, properties, you know, whether it be multifamily or, you know, house hacking and stuff like that. But uh, for people that are looking to get into kind of the hard asset, you know, the, you know, actually buying properties, getting started that way. Um, I, I wanted to go over just a couple of things that um, I hear from people a lot, which are probably if you're here listening and you've been thinking about getting into buying rental properties, these are probably the things that are holding you back um, because I hear it from people every day. So, um, I always tell people that, hey, real estate might be for you. It might not be for you. I tell probably 50, 50, um, you know, people every single day, yes and no, because um, obviously it is different than stocks. Um, it can be more strenuous just in the, in the beginning phases as far as educating yourself, finding properties, getting familiar with um, the numbers and setting it up. But it doesn't always have to be something that is, um, you know, completely strenuous. It can be pretty passive. And I'll explain that because I know a lot of people have questions about that. But um, the first thing I always hear, you know, that I think is kind of a false belief around real estate is people go immediately before I even get started. Well, I don't want to be a landlord, which is um, to that, I would say, I'm not a landlord either. You know, I have a property manager. So I think that's the most important thing right off the bat is that um, if I had to be a landlord, um, which we don't have enough uh, time tonight to go into the story of how I figured out that I didn't want to be a landlord. Um, you know, that, that's really a big thing where um, having a property manager, A, it, it does a couple of different things. One, you don't have to, um, you know, manage the property on a day-to-day, month-to-month basis. You don't have to deal with tenants. And then the big thing it also does, which kind of leads me into the next false belief, is it allows you to buy wherever you want for the most part uh, because you're not having to, you know, go there physically. You know, it doesn't really matter as much where you are as long as you have a team, you know, wherever it is, a realtor a lender, a property manager, et cetera. But the big one, you know, obviously after the purchase is the property manager. So um, I pay my property manager 8% per month. Um, and I, I, you know, it's funny because I, I always tell people, yeah, I pay him 8% and he does 98% of the work every month. Um, but that's that's the fee. There are some fees, you know, in the setup as far as when they find tenants and different stuff like that. Um, but for me, there's no way that I would be able to continue to buy properties and scale if I didn't have someone running it. So um, I personally don't really ever go to my properties. Um, they are within driving distance, but it wouldn't really matter where I live because I have, you know, him doing it. Of course, I keep up with what's going on with the property with them. I keep up with the accounting and all that kind of stuff. But as far as I think people in their mind, they have this idea where, you know, you have to be driving by the property every single day and you've got to be dealing with the tenants and, you know, you've got to be chasing people down for money and all that stuff, um, you know, which if you are a landlord, maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. But um, I always recommend to people the biggest thing is, is to make sure to get a property manager if you can, if you're looking to, to get into it, because I believe um, that it's worth it. And again, the second part there, um, a, a lot of times, especially right now, people are all saying, well, you know, my market's too expensive or whatever. Um, which is, which is, you know, makes sense, right? You know, but the thing is you don't have to buy in your market. Um, you know, if you're able to find markets where, you know, obviously the Midwest, the South, there's a lot of places where there are triplexes for under a hundred thousand dollars, you know, and people like laugh at that. I'm like, dude, just go on the internet. Like they're everywhere. Um, you know, so there are a lot of places where there are still affordable buildings just because it's that price doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good buy. Um, but you know, if price is the main thing, you know, holding someone back, there are options out there, um, you know, because most people, they live in LA or New York or, you know, Dallas or whatever, just because, you know, duh, most people live in the bigger cities, right? So most of the people probably listening to this um, are doing that. But I know people that in all the major cities that invest elsewhere. Um, and then the second one is, is house hacking, which is a great way for people to really get started. Um, and that's buying in your market, buying a house, and the advantage of that is typically when you buy, um, you know, something and live in it, you're able to use a down payment of three to five percent, just depending on the type of property, depending on the lender. Um, but some people might be able to buy, you know, a duplex, triplex, quadplex, 
um, for as little as three to five percent down. Um, and that way you're able to afford, you know, a much larger, um, you know, uh, or sorry, a much higher price building. And what you're able to do is live in one unit, rent out the other three units. And then, you know, the goal of it is the rent from those other units pays off your mortgage, pays off your your property taxes, your insurance, your maintenance, your utilities, right? And so each, each one's a little bit different. Obviously, it depends on the market, depends on what you're able to charge for rent. Um, but there are some really cool options like that for people to get started. Um, and I think that's one of the best ones. ones it's one of the ones that I always teach because, um, you know, your biggest expense likely is rent. So I always ask people, what's your rent right now? You know, like write it down or say it in your head. It's either a thousand or 1500 or 2000 or 2500. And I go, you know, if, if your rent went away tomorrow, what would that allow you to do? And for most people, you know, 1500 a month, $2,000 a month, whether you save up and buy another property with that in a year or two or invest that in the stock market or pay down your debt, or, you know, obviously <laughs> the, the issue is usually not figuring out what to do with $2,000. It's, it's finding a way to get $2,000. Um, so house hacking can be an incredible way to do that. But um, that's kind of what I wanted to do. And obviously I can answer any questions. I don't want to go too long. I get kind of excited and, and I tend not to shut up. So I want to stop there. But those are kind of some things that I, you know, hear from people the most as far as why they can't do it. Um, so I like to kind of attack those false beliefs and make sure that if you decide real estate's not for you, I'm OK with that. But we have to at least be basing it off of a belief that is true. Well, I love the gems that you just dropped there. I feel like you, like you just said, you took all the disbeliefs and kind of took them head on. Um, I really like you pointing out there that you do not have to be the one that's doing, you know, the majority of that work that you have. Uh, somebody who is doing most of the, you know, landlord duties for you. Uh, you're paying them a percentage, right? You're still able to have a great exposure to real estate without having to make it your whole life. Um, so I, I really do um, love and appreciate that. And also, I just want to point out to everyone, if you're you know, listening in, you're like, oh, there's gems or you came in a little bit late. Um, we did have also this recorded. Um, so I did have somebody that's in the audience and is able to be recording right now. Um, so I will post that later. But also, I just tell the speakers, um, if while you're not speaking, if somebody else speaking, please just make sure your mic is muted. Um, that way, there won't be any background noise. That's awesome. Okay. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, uh, initial, you know, just my one thought right off the bat is, you know, how can somebody, I think you kind of showed, you know, building of an empire, but what would be like just the first step, right? Somebody just wants to get a little bit of exposure. They don't have a ton of money. How can they just, you know, start by scaling in? Well, you know, I, to, uh, the, yeah. the, the best way or one way is to house hack because it does allow you to, to have a much lower down payment, live in the house, get the experience and build from there. But what I tell other people too is, you know, there, there's there's ten different ways I can answer that question, and it's going to be a sliding scale of risk. Um, but the the least risky ways are finding ways to use real estate to make more money. Because if you don't have money, you know, you don't have a real estate problem, you have a money problem. So, um, but there's ways that you can take out both of those, like two birds with one stone, and that is, you know, either become a realtor, you can learn how to wholesale deals, which you're basically just going out and finding deals and then you're selling them to investors. You're taking the cut without ever having to buy the property or put money down. But what that can allow you to do when you do something like that is get exposure to real estate, learn, learn about it. You're going to be hopefully working for someone that knows what they're doing. If it's a wholesaler or a bro, you know, real estate brokerage or whatever. So you're learning from people, you're learning about it, you're uh, building relationships, you're getting exposure to deals. Um, and then also the big one, obviously, is if you're wholesaling or working in real estate, um, you're going to be able to make more money. And so maybe you start off by wholesaling a few deals. You make 5000 10000 10000 et cetera. Um, you know, you start to get a hang of it. And then a really good deal comes across your desk. And instead of maybe selling it to someone else, you know, now you have the capital set aside to, to take it for yourself. Perfect. I appreciate that as an intro there. All right, I'm going to keep it moving. Uh, Philip. We got you up here. First Twitter space yes. you're doing, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, for anyone who's unfamiliar, you know, uh, last few weeks I've got to know Philip a little bit better. He's doing some amazing stuff over at Nice Group. That's N-Y-C-E. Uh, some the Yahoo Finance called them the Robin Hood of real estate. And he's got an amazing real estate community and a bunch of stuff. So, Philip, you know, 
initial like thoughts, if you could give maybe a little bit on, you know, your background, what you're doing and why your approach to real estate's a bit different. Yes. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. All right. All right. My approach to real estate is a little different. All right. So what I just heard was that uh, I heard a couple of different things that would be useful for beginners trying to start out in real estate, particularly doing the whole uh, quote unquote house hacking packing thing, which is how I started five years ago. I bought an FHA finance property, three and a half percent down, $750,000, three brand new apartments in, in the in one property in Jersey City. And with that one, I was able to not going to belabor you and bore you with the details too much. But from there, I was able to leverage that in five years into 2000 apartments. I can always tell that story another time. But as I was doing that, uh, around a year and a half ago when the pandemic hit, I decided that I wanted to carve out because I own my real estate free and clear. I wanted to, to help other people get in, get started with real estate investing. So I decided to create a tech platform like Robinhood, where people can own a piece of real estate, $400 and become micro landlords. And from there, hopefully go out and do the same thing that I did. So that's sort of my approach when you mentioned the community aspect of things. But one of the things that I've done is, uh, again, not going into too much detail. I'm going to, I want to keep it focused on the real estate aspect of things. But a lot of times people don't understand that they're, they think the barrier to entry is much greater than it actually is. A lot of people don't know. I didn't know that you can actually own a building with very little mon money down. One of the people in our community actually started with a property in Philadelphia. I know it was, I think it was a Tyler that mentioned <laughs> the mention that you can buy properties, three family properties for a hundred thousand. You don't even have to go to markets in the Midwest. You can do that in Philadelphia, which is 90 minutes from New York. And it's a large Metro Metro market. That is, uh, like I said, one of the people in our community did that with 2,200 down, uh, bought a property, fix it up on to the next one. And then you unlock a lot of equity and you get to learn as you go and you remove one of the, if not the largest overhead driver in your personal life, which is rent. You remove that by living in a property and then you have, uh, you have the other tenants paying for your expenses. So it's a tremendous way to get started with number one, learning how to manage business, uh, profit and losses, P and L statements, financials, being responsible, all the things that comes with it. And it comes it's a daily grind. So you learn it without even realizing that you are learning. Right. And that's why I like that. I heard wholesaling also. I have my thoughts on that. I definitely believe that this is one of the best ways to get started. And that's what I did. And like I said, build it into verse 1500, excuse me, 1500 apartments. And that's around 2000 with the ones that we've completed uh, the development projects we've completed in the last year, year and a half. And here we are. And now I'm helping through the app, the idea is for other people to get to own real estate the same way. And that's what we, does that, does that answer your question, Gap? And the whole idea is that $100 is never going to turn into a million dollars on its own. Uh, obviously, you need to do it consistently. You have to apply that consistently and with that discipline over time, you will be begin to comp compound wealth, whether it's in real estate or whether it's just investing in the, in the broader stock market. That's the that's really the, the secret sauce is just doing it consistently. However, you can unlock a lot of multiples by doing it the real estate way because, number one, is illiquid and and it's just the way that, that, that it works. So you, you can unlock greater multiples that way. To answer your question directly, we simply give them the know-how to, to get that started. Number one, you got to have two years tax return. Number two, you got to have your credit in order. And from there, you can go out and get pre-approved for a mortgage, which effectively gives you your buying power. If you pre-approve for 200000 250000 300000 boom, you know exactly what your buying power is. And then you can start to maneuver within that within that contextual paradigm, right? You know exactly how much you can buy and, and, and what you can get. And from there, you can actually move on to the next phase and, and roll it over to another property like that or decide to just do the way that I like to do it. I like to grow sequentially and intelligently in manageable increments, meaning Three family, another three family, maybe five units, maybe 10 units. And then you go on from there because you can, the growth curve, excuse me, the learning curve isn't too dramatic and you don't get swallowed by your own growth or your bullish ambition. Does that make sense? And you see that a lot of times, whether it's in the startup world, whether it's in business or it's in real estate, people get too excited and bullish and they get in over their head. So that's what I mainly teach you. Get those get those things right. And that's really, that's, that's the tools that they get. Get the pre-approval letter, go out there and make some bids and- Start to position yourself for the future. And it's really, it's a tried and tested formula that it just works.
And if it turns out that real estate isn't for you being an active landlord, you'll find it out too when you're still living rent-free. Make sense? Definitely does. And I'm learning more about it every day. Um, you know, I'm excited to be seeing everything that ICE is doing. Appreciate you, you know, coming up, Philip, and chatting. Um, mm -hmm. Stick around. We're going to have a little bit more uh, discussion. Awesome. awesome, man. All right. Uh, moving next, I uh, just want to give each one of our speakers a little bit of a chance to speak. And then we'll have, like I said, a little bit more on the high level and macro and future of the industry. Because I think right now we're kind of doing, you know, exposure to the industry, but it's also going to talk about the future. Um, Bull Trade Finder, also my first space that you've been on. Welcome to it. Hey, how you doing? Doing great. How's everything about you? Doing good. Everything's good, actually. Awesome. So, you know, you reached out to me and mentioned that, you know, you had some uh, personal experiences within this industry. So I'd love to hear, you know, your side of yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just beginning to. Uh, I'm 23 years old. I have five properties, uh, which is just about 16 units. Um, and honestly, Tyler from Defining Wealth basically – you know, hit a lot of points um, that I went through and a lot of points that, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about specifically the landlord thing. People don't want to be landlords. And, you know, that's a big thing um, because you truly don't have to be the landlord. Um, and, you know, if you build the right team, uh, this is kind of where I started. So I built a team. I built, I got a good real estate agent. I got a good property manager. I met all these people. Um, before I even, you know, really went into, you know, buying properties and, you know, figuring out all this information about, you know, how to grow my real estate portfolio. And I got information from them. I got information from a friend that I used to work with who was actually in the real estate world. And, you know, that's kind of how I started growing. Um, you know, without this team, and without them helping me and guide me along the way, you know, I definitely want to be where I am right now. And I'm only just beginning. Um, but, you know, it's definitely been a great start. And I definitely want to touch on the Burr method because I actually started out, sadly, I bought my first two properties with cash because I didn't think I would make or I didn't think I'd actually be able to get a loan, uh, especially in the area where I was buying only because the prices are a, a little uh, low. And, you know, that's another thing that Tyler and actually Philip just talked about. You know, you can find areas that are growing or you can find areas that are good that, you know, they're priced low and they could be far away as long as they're managed, you know, by someone. You don't have to personally manage them yourself. And, you know, that's exactly what I did. I tried to find areas that were growing or at least that were good areas. And I would, you know, came upon this one specific area the prices were pretty low the cap rates are around 15 to 17 percent uh depending on the property um some could be a little bit higher you know nothing really over 20 and some could be a little bit lower nothing really under 10 it's just a really good area the prices are you know kind of perfect if you really want to start investing um and i kind of went up there one to two times you know met the people met my first uh looked at my first properties myself. Um, and ever since then, I actually usually have my real estate agent and property manager, as well as my inspector, you know, kind of go through the new properties that I'm buying and I don't even have to go up there. Um, and the reason, you know, I kind of do that is because the drive is around 67 hours. And, you know, I really kind of don't want to make that drive every time just to check out one property and then do the same thing going back another 67 hours. That's just a 13 hour day that I don't really want to, you know, plan out. So I make sure I do all the numbers right. I get all the information from my property manager, my inspector, and my real estate agent. And we kind of go through the details, you know, together. Uh, thankfully, like I said, these guys are great. And uh, I definitely wouldn't be here uh, where I am right now without them. And there's just so much to touch on. So uh, if you guys have any questions or, you know, if we talk about anything else going on throughout the chat, you know, I'll definitely chime in as well. Yo, Gav, I don't know if it's just me, but you sound like a robot. Yeah, I couldn't hear anything. Yeah, I'm hearing the same thing as well. Uh, same here. Yeah, I'm not like Robocop <laughs> in a bad <laughs> drunken binge. It'll, it'll probably come back in a second. My no, service has been terrible. 
is. Yeah. I was just saying to you, um, you know, Bull Train Finder, that it's inspiring that at 23, where, you know, I'm 23 myself, that you already have this whole community built, five properties and everything that, you know, um, and I completely agree with what you're saying, that it's all about, you know, finding the people who are experts and, you know, leaning on them and taking that advice. And I think that's exactly what we're doing in this space. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there, there's just so much information to go around and, you know, it, it could be people that you don't even know that are willing to help you and, you know, guide you, uh, you know, through it all, basically. Yeah. Yeah. 100% on the exact same path as you. So, you know, excited that I have this group of people and that's what we're trying to do in these spaces is just every single day, you know, we're, do we're doing different topics on spaces. For example, you know, earlier this week did some technical analysis. This morning did growth stocks and fundamentals with Jonah Lupton. Now we're doing real estate, have NFT space tomorrow. There's all these different areas where people are very willing to, you know, help out and a lot of them have their DMs open. So I would continue to, you know, lean on these people if this is something that you're interested in getting into. And also, um, I have mentioned this on several of the Twitter spaces, but if you look at my pinned tweet, it's a schedule of all my Twitter spaces. But if you don't have to, if you don't want to have to write all of them down, but you want to know when they are. Well, this is actually Twitter space 7 of 11 that I'm hosting this week. And I am happy to add you to my free public Google Calendar. If you're interested, just DM me and send me your email and just say you want to be added to the calendar. And I'm happy to add you to the public calendar. So that way you can see all the Twitter spaces on your calendar. There's hundreds of people on that Google Calendar. Okay, I'm going to keep it moving. Um, Ashley, so you're an actual real estate broker, right? What's uh, everything been like from your perspective? Hey, yeah. Um, so I have been a real estate broker for a couple of years and worked for a real estate technology firm. Um, so I mainly have worked with the residential side and a lot of um, basically I was a business an analyst for about five years for a real estate firm. Um, so a lot of my experience comes from reading the market and, um, you know, trying to help people negotiate deals um, let's see. I, I know, um, well, I don't know. I'm sure all of you know this, but Dallas is one of the, um, top 10 busiest, um, places in the housing market. So it, it's unreal. The, the amount of business that we've been getting, um, a lot of our buyers, they come from all over the world. Um, a lot of them come from California, a lot of them from multiple different countries. I had a recently, um, somebody buy a home for me in France. Um, so it's just, it's insane to watch how much has grown. Cause even, uh, last year, um, you know, there was maybe, um, a few transactions in a month and a lot of us are having five to 10 transactions in a month as real estate agents. So the money here that's flowing in is just insane. Yeah. It's, it's Wolfie, did you have a comment there? I I didn't. Did I? Did my thing come off or something? Oh yeah, I I just um, saw it come off. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but actually, you know, it, so with that movement, Ashley, you know, as it's picked up, has this become something where you've seen a lot more people trying to gain exposure, and have people, you know, maybe been coming to you seeking advice? Like, what's been, you know, your take on this movement in the industry? Um, basically a lot of people have been asking me about whether or not it's a good time to buy because the mortgage rates here are so amazing that, I mean, there, some of them are even under 3% I've seen, which I haven't seen that, you know, ever, um, for a long time. And, um, or at least with some of the newer buyers that I have, cause I work with a lot of FHA buyers, um, so a lot of people are, are saying, you know, would it be better to buy now, even though the prices are higher because the interest rates are so low. And that's one of my biggest questions that I get. And it's hard to answer for each individual, um, because everybody has different circumstances, whether it be FHA loans, conventional loans. Um, so it, it's hard, it's hard to answer these questions because the real estate market, especially in Texas now is so volatile because, um, there's so many things happening, you know, Elon's moving his, um, business to Texas. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, like I was saying before from different countries and different States going here. Um, you know, it's happening all over the United States and, and really all over that I've seen just the real estate, um, industry just booming. Um, but I always get scared to advise people on taking on that extra mortgage when, 
in my opinion, just from what I'm seeing, we might be, you know, in Texas looking at a kind of a, a bubble um, in the next maybe six months or so. So it's just been um, a lot of people are just unsure what to do because everything's flowing so much. And I think somebody was saying before, but a lot of people have FOMO when it comes to real estate. So um, that's the, the most interesting thing about it is everybody really wants to get in, but then when they're in and things aren't going well, they don't want to stay in or they lose their house. Yeah, I hear that. Um, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that there could be a pullback in the next six months. I think that that could be food for topic um, after our last uh, couple of speakers um, go for it. I think we'll come back to that, but appreciate you being on here, Ashley, and, you know, excited to hear, you know, more of your insights. Um, okay. Uh, Wolfie, would you like to maybe give a little bit of uh, thoughts? I know that you mentioned to me that you're more of like, you know, charting or anything, but have you dabbled at all in real estate? Yeah. And <clears throat> Excuse me. Wow. That's a really bad start. No, so I, uh, I'm mostly an investor and a trader these days, um, both private and public. But I do have uh, a couple of properties with some partners, uh, one of which we rent out to studios and shoots and stuff like that. And then um, we have a, basically like a couple of townhomes that are one building. Uh, it's multifamily, but it's kind of, you know, it's kind of this like weird la industrial style homes if you've seen them you'd know what i'm talking about where they're like behind each other basically um and we rent out uh rooms in those homes um to foreign exchange students one of the guys that that uh is part of the team is uh has a connection with a couple of foreign uh foreign colleges and basically we onboard them with um room uh board, all that stuff, uh, one flat rate, everything furnished three months at a time. Uh, so that's my experience on like housing and stuff. I don't have, you know, the broad knowledge that like everybody else does. Uh, it's not really my forte, but I could more, more speak to like some of the, uh, private trends that I've been seeing, like with my, you know, some of the investments that I, I've, I've put my money into, uh, and some of my partners put their money into recently. Um, and I can kind of go over some like basic, you know, public side stuff if anybody's interested. But I, I just wanted to kind of give an overall and, and let you lead me. Yeah, I think that the, you know, I'd be interested to hear in some of this private stuff, maybe just a couple of minutes. And then I'll go to, uh, I guess, the only Tyler that we have left. And then we'll go into some more open discussion. Yeah, so um, some of the trends that have, like, really piqued my interest are the, so, like, COVID really gave us, like, a pull forward on the way that we live our lives and on um, the way that our expectations have shifted, right? So pre-COVID, you had a lot of these, you know, brick-and-mortar stores that were able to kind of sustain, and people were like, is this going to be left for dead, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then during COVID, we needed everything yesterday. We needed, we needed it for as cheap as possible, as fast as possible. Um, and so there's a lot of, um, privates that are aimed to service those needs. So basically like re, uh, refabbing existing brick and mortar stuff for logistics centers or for last mile transit, et cetera. Um, I found that that's been a common thing that is pretty uh, universally great in part because the, um, you know, the, the funds that I'm speaking of had, they're, they're not pitching. So like if you and I came up with this idea, like, Hey, we want to be the logistics uh, intermediary for like, you know, whatever uh, Macy's or something, right. It would take us a lot of inexperience, a lot of trial and error, et cetera. Um, and you know, most of these businesses probably fail. Uh, the, the privates that I've seen and I've invested in, uh, they have the infrastructure in place. They have the, um, background in place. And more importantly, they have the contracts, which last for like five, 10 years, 15, whatever. Um, and you're really just trusting a already proved out model to kind of, um, you know, expand and 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 adapt to the way that we've adapted that's one another one that i've found interesting is like 
you know, uh, a lot of these, uh, or not another one, another, another reason that I found it interesting is a lot of these centers that are getting uh, re refurbished or uh, rehabilitated are located in, you know, really prime locations. So it, they're, they're old real estate, uh, old, uh, excuse me, retail brick and mortar shops that are located, you know, universally X number of miles from uh, different uh, suburban cities and whatnot. And so the, they really have an interesting uh, double edge. So they have the edge of being able to being having been done that and successfully done it enough to be able to acquire contracts and then also having locations throughout the country that are basically close close enough to you know take advantage and scale up uh, another another trend that i've seen that i found interesting is trying to um like you had all these so for a while like all these co-working places were a hot thing and now like they're not a hot thing as much as they were and you know, have the we work thing and so now you have all these different offices and all this commercial real estate that people are trying to get inventive with with using. And one of the things that's, that I've seen pop, pop up lately uh, with some of these privates is, again, taking taking those facilities and then adjusting uh, the use case and changing it from whatever it was to, you know, things like uh, biomedical uh, uh, labs or, you know, um, medical facilities and and whatnot now that we're uh, on the on the next on the precipice of the next boom there so so those are the, some of the things that i've seen and the last one that i thought was really interesting was uh refrigeration so now we, we're all before covid like uh a lot of people wouldn't order their groceries online a lot of people would say things like i want to um feel my you know avocados before i buy them or whatnot but now we kind of got forced into that and a lot of people got forced into that. And so now there's more and more people doing that. And so a lot of these facilities that had warehouses or had um, different use cases are, again, trying to find um, ways to use it. And they're using it for like refrigeration and they're using it for perishables and things of that nature. So those are like the three main ones that I've seen I've personally invested in. Um, outside of that, there's like, a bunch of REITs uh, publicly traded um, and there's a lot of different uses and a lot of different ways people can look at it. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I'll pause for now. Awesome. I appreciate the info there. And yeah, great with those three overall points as to the direction that that industry is moving, um, you know, based on just economic and geographic events kind of over the last year. Uh, Brock, I want to bring it back to you. Um, now we'll have more of an open discussion. You know, we'd love to hear our speakers kind of come in um, at will. You could just use the little raise hand or I will call um, to move around. I definitely want to, you know, bring Chris uh, back into this as well. It's been a little bit since you spoke, uh, but I do want to give everybody that chance. I will say it's a little bit on me. I have noticed um, I, I may have overbooked some panels uh, this week. Um, I might do maybe more panels next week, but with maybe like four or five people per just to give people more time to speak. So I apologize. That's on me if somebody's not getting enough time to speak. Um, tomorrow I have one that's way overbooked. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But going into next week, just so everyone knows, I'll, I'll keep a better eye on that. Um, so Brock, bringing it back to you, you mentioned that you wanted to kind of give more of an industry update and talk about what's you know going on with pricing. I think that's a great place to talk about with macro. So we'd love to give you, you know that overview on that, and then we can move around. Yeah, no worries. I know uh, I, I'm excited to that, that we brought in so many different perspectives here already: commercial, residential, multifamily, single-family stocks. You know, so that's that. I, you know, as much as anything, that's what I was hoping we got to expose everyone to, and uh, you know, give some great accounts to follow, depending on which or all of these that might be interesting. But one thing I can do that I think we talked about was just talk, just kind of give the narrative of what's been going on in the industry in the past kind of crazy 18 months or so. Um, residential is most of my focus, but I can do my best to talk about what I think it meant for commercial real estate too, and give others a, chump, a chance to jump in that might know more than me. Um, but first of all, you know, going back, to, I've, I've been uh, working in kind of executive type roles and partnership type roles with different real estate companies for about seven years now. And so, you know, it's pretty smooth sailing from, uh, you know, when I started until about 18 months ago. And then a lot of things changed really fast. Um, and a lot of that ended up actually being good for the industry um, long-term. 
um, as it has with, you know, different tech enabled industries as well. Um, but, you know, I think it'd be interesting to go back to that time, uh, you know, February, 2020, give or take, and, you know, talk about what that meant. So when, um, we were talking about, you know, both at my company and just, you know, in the industry, real estate industry kind of media about how to think about the impact COVID's going to have on real estate. We, and real estate prices, real estate, um, like transaction velocity, all this stuff. We, you know, did the one thing that we could take the data that was available and the data that was available at the time were the countries that had faster, um, outbreaks of COVID, uh, or earlier outbreaks of COVID namely China and Italy. And so at the time, February, March, 2020, all these stocks got crushed for the publicly traded real estate companies. Um, you know, Realogies went, had been at $20, $30 in the past year or two and got, you know, came down way below $5, way below $4 at times. Um, so pretty, you know, unbelievable hit. And the reason for that was because it was being modeled against those other countries that were losing like, you know, 80% of their, of their real estate transactional velocity and losing like 50% of their real estate prices, you know, on the average home. And so in China and in Italy, it went on for, you know, months and months of just being absolutely crushed, the real estate market being absolutely crushed. And so everyone got really conservative for a minute. And then by, you know, summer of 2020, um, prices and, and transaction kind of velocity both started picking up quite a bit. And, you know, fast forward to today and um, as of August, which was, you know, there's probably starting to be September data released, which I haven't reviewed yet. But August 2021, as compared to August 2020, was the fastest um, increase in price, the fastest um, increase in pricing in one year um, in, in the last 45 years. So in the last 45 years, August 2021 versus August 2020 was the biggest change. It was a little over 18 uh, percent for the average home in America. So especially considering most people, you know, essentially own their house in a leveraged way, um, that was that's an unbelievable boon to homeowners and unbelievably costly uh, to renters that didn't get that exposure. And so, you know, there's I think now as much as anything, there's fear of, um, you know, just kind of like a more and more intense um you know, like haves and have nots situation, uh, depending on whether you're a real estate owner or you're a renter. Um, and that gets even more extreme as you think about people that have access to, uh, to more and more lines of credit and more and more, uh, homes in the industry. So what's interesting to me and, you know, predictions are, are, uh, you know, I don't really trust weather reports. So I don't know if I should trust these type of reports, but a lot of data that's, um, there are a lot of, uh, projections that have come out in the last few weeks, uh, tend to be thinking that real estate, residential real estate prices in America will go up a similar amount next year. Um, so I think um, 18% year over year in the past 12 months is the current pace, uh, which again was the fastest in a really long time in 45 years. But the prediction is that it'll go up another, you know, 15, 16, 70% next year. And so, you know, I think we had a few people that were real estate brokers on the panel here and probably some others that are in the audience. And this is a conversation that always comes up is like, I, you know, I don't know if I want to buy right now. And, you know, there's there's no perfect answer to that. But the answer over time it has always been that, you know, inflation's happening. Owning assets is better than than renting assets as long as they're, um, you know, hard assets that hold hold value and in general real estate's held value. So. You know, I, I still tend to think it's a reasonably good time to try to buy. It's just an extremely competitive time to buy. So the other the other thing going on is that rents are going up pretty dramatically. Rents are up about 12% in the past 12 months. So not quite as much as home prices, but pretty darn close. And um, so it's been interesting to see um, that now so many commercial companies um, and, and big investors are, you know, Wall Street companies, as well as, you know, family funds, as well as people that are just buying a handful of properties personally, are now um, jumping into all these markets or people, you know, overseas are jumping into all these markets and competing with the individual first time home buyer. Um, so, you know, not the topic of this discussion, but I, um, I, I've jumped, jumped into a startup that focuses, um, on helping individual consumers win, you know, actually win competitive bids, um, by helping, you know, them deal with other financial circumstances in their life to make them able to make stronger offers. 
And, you know, I think the whole reason that, or a significant part of the reason that um, all these different platforms are coming up, like fractional investing, like ways for consumers um, to make better types of more competitive offers the first or second time they're buying a property as a, as a consumer is because this competition is something that's never really happened. Um, the, the amount of inventory available in the country for single family homes, especially, but even for multifamily homes, it's, it's pretty similar, I think. Um, there is just kind of unmatched. So, you know, supply and demand is saying demand is, you know, average, maybe above average supply is an all time low. And so it's hard to imagine what would make prices go down other than some really significant macro event again, like, um, like, you know, happens every now and then. But for the most part, it seems like the real estate industry is just, um, riding with an inflationary wave, riding with a low inventory wave and low, which is a low supply wave. Um, and so it's hard to imagine that home prices are going to do anything, but at least be steady, but more likely go up, um, from my perspective on, on kind of the macro situation commercial, I was saying, you know, I'm not as much an expert on it all, but with commercial real estate, I think it's been a little bit of a different story. Um, you know, it's been kind of a, the best year of all time for e-commerce, uh, shipping, you know, um, margins, <laughs> shipping's had its own issues, I guess. So I shouldn't, shouldn't go too far over my skis there, but, um, for e-commerce specifically, uh, versus, you know, stores, uh, physical locations, brick and mortar. And so, you know, I think there's been a little bit of a, a you know, return to uh, normalcy with people going out to stores, but definitely not uh, to where it was before. And so I think um, commercial real estate is maybe living a very different sort of uh, macro situation than residential real estate. Um, but, you know, on the residential side, populations are going up. There's not nearly enough home building going on. And I guess the final point I'll make, um, and for any of you that follow Zillow stock or own Zillow stock, you saw an example of that this week. Um, it's gotten really difficult uh, to acquire materials. It's gotten really difficult to hire contractors. It's gotten really difficult to do rehab on homes. Um, you know, the joke everyone was making a few months ago about plywood being the best investment in the world because it like went up like 10 times in value in like a few weeks, a few months back um, is actually, you know, a real thing where... Uh, there's not enough uh, ways to get the work done on houses to either build that, build new houses, renovate existing houses. It's gotten extremely expensive. And so, you know, one example of that's Zillow suspended their Zillow offers program where they were buying and rehabbing and flipping houses, um, also known as an iBuyer, OfferPad and others are competing. But, you know, it's kind of a sign of the times, I think, that Zillow was um, not even able to keep up with their kind of um, renovation and flipping um, channel because you know they're one of the most well-funded companies in the space and it's just really hard to do so all that to say I think there's not nearly enough supply for the demand um, that we're seeing in the industry and so there's going to be some interesting kind of like uh, I think cracks in the in the system here <laughs> that are going to have to be solved either by innovation or by, you know, changing macro circumstances. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of how I see what's been going on here. And I think there's some companies that are well positioned to be winners in that sort of a world and uh, others that are going to really suffer. So, um, and, and, you know, other types of investments. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of give that general rundown on what I think it's looked like and uh, see what other panelists think, or I'd love if anyone from the commercial side or multifamily side could talk about it from their world. Well, that was pretty in depth, and I always appreciate getting the full picture. So, I, and I also appreciate you showing off. You know, this is your area of expertise within the you know, residential side versus the commercial, and going into each of those areas. And yeah, absolutely, I would love for another one of our panelists to hit on those commercial areas. So, I see your hands up, full trade partner. So, I'm going to go to you, and then Chris. I'm going to come back to you, and Chris. I would. I know you got a little bit of a uh, you know time to speak earlier, but I'd love to hear maybe um, you know more elongated. Um, similar to, you know, what Brock was talking about, if you could talk to the commercial side um, or to some other areas. But first, going to you, Bull Trade Finder. Yeah. Uh, first of all, everyone who spoke so far has done amazing. Uh, but, yeah, I just want to hit some points again. So, you know, talking about pricing, uh, for example, the first two houses that I bought uh, just about a year and a half ago, two years, um, I they're up about – 
it's just crazy how how much the prices have gone up recently. They're up about at least 50 to 60% in just like a year and a half, two years. Um, and like I said, I, my houses were pretty cheap, um, around 60 to 70,000. Um, but, you know, for it to go up that much in this area, by the way, I've done a lot of research on this area. This area does not really grow that much uh, price-wise. And during the recession in 08, 09, uh, house prices in this area only dropped around five to 7%. So it doesn't really, you know, die down either. So the fact that it did that, you know, it's pretty crazy to me. Um, and, you know, to bring insight on that, I used to see four to like six houses, you know, every two weeks show up around two years ago that provided very good cash flow. And, you know, it would take them, you know, two to four weeks to even get off the market. Now I see maybe one to two houses every month that come on. And I literally have to fight with my real estate agent to put in an offer. And they're already being sold literally the next day. And I'm not even lying about that. Literally the next day they are off the market. It's just literally crazy how literally a year and a half has changed all this information. Um, you know, a good example of that is I recently just bought 11 units um, for around 175000 This same owner that is selling, you know, other units and his houses are very, you know, they're in good shape and, you know, it's a good area. And he literally is pricing. So it's 16 units that he's selling now and he's pricing them for more than double. Actually, yeah. So I bought mine for 175 k for 11 units. He's pricing 16 units for around 410000 And that's within three months. So he's pricing basically five units more for basically double the price. And they're the same type of houses. There's nothing different. Actually, mine might be even in better condition. And he actually did sell them. So it, it's just crazy how much, you know, these houses are going off the market so quick. And my real estate agent and my property manager even told me this as well. I mean, they're seeing new buyers from different areas that they'd never seen before. They're seeing them from out of state. They're seeing them from out of country. And I know Ashley talked about that um, and she's in Texas. So it, it's definitely, you know, something crazy that's going on now. And I, I really don't know when the prices will drop. I don't know if they'll keep continuing, but, you know, I'm trying to acquire as much as I can. Uh, luckily, I'm in a state where, you know, if the prices were to fall, um, one, at least I still have the asset, but two, I'll still be able to pay it off. And the company, uh, not the companies, the properties are still, you know, cash flowing you know perfectly that i wouldn't really have to worry about a price drop you know in the future or anything um my goal with these properties is just to keep them as you know income properties and you know keep the cash flow rolling ever rolling in every month and but you know i just wanted to you know touch on the points that ashley and brock talked about because it is crazy how you know high these prices are going and just wanted to give you an insight on how you know how my properties are literally from 60 to seventy thousand. They're easily worth ninety five to a hundred thousand, if not maybe another ten K off that. So it, it's just really crazy. Yeah, that run up has certainly been insane. And you know, props to you for you know getting in at the right time and having the exposure that you did during that crazy run. And I think, you know, maybe one of the next things we can talk about, I do want to go to Chris and then I know Philip has a couple of comments, is how to now hedge against maybe some downside protection uh, against the potential, you know, drop in pricing. So Chris, you know, we've kind of heard, I think some pretty good macro stuff here. Um, we'd love to give you a little bit, you know, the longer time to speak, uh, especially if you have any perspective on the uh, commercial side. Sure. Um, kind of just to, before I jump into commercial, kind of just to continue what Nas was saying. In my neighborhood, I'm the president of the homeowner association in my direct neighborhood. It's about 71 homes. And six homes have sold here in the last few months, and all six homes have sold within the first weekend. All six homes have sold above ask, and all six homes had multiple offers within those first two or three days. So the residential market is definitely extreme. I mean, I love it because I'm in my house for a number of years, but at some point, I think this will cool off. I lived through uh, 05, 06, 07 into 2008, and eventually it will top, and eventually it will kind of fall back down. It's a little bit different this time. Um, but switching over into the commercial side, it's interesting because we have COVID, we have remote work, so people are kind of coming out of the big inner cities. They want to stay in the suburbs. They don't want to commute into the cities. And I live outside of New York City, and it could be a bear of a commute going in. 
Um, so a lot of folks go into these remote offices. But with that said, if you look at New York City in the last, say, six or eight months or so, you have a number of different companies coming in there and either buying buildings or making large leases in the city. So, for example, Google just bought a building in New York for $2.1 billion. It's the most expensive purchase of a building in New York, um, perhaps even ever, um, if not in a long time. Facebook took 750,000 square feet over at the uh, Farley building near Hudson Yards. Then you have Amazon, you have TikTok, Roku, Splunk, Apple, Microsoft, and the kind of list goes on and on. All these firms have taken at least 100,000 square feet of space or more over the past 12 months. So whether or not, and, and none of these firms have employees coming into the office at this point, but they're taking this space. And if in New York City, you're taking 100,000 square feet. And if you're in Midtown, you're looking at anywhere from 60 to $85 a square foot um, for a lease. I mean, this, we're not talking small change here. We're talking millions and millions, if not tens of millions of dollars of lease costs that these companies are going in for. So um, I do think the commercial office space has been hurt somewhat. But rental rates haven't come down too much in the past 18 months. And, and New York City is always a little unique. Even in 2008, when we had Bear Stearns and Lehman and, and we were kind of going through that financial crisis, what I saw then was a lot of firms that went out of business in Midtown um, were replaced by firms that used to house themselves either on 11th or 12th Avenue or 1st and 2nd Avenue. And they moved into Midtown because now they could afford those rental rates. So New York never really lost its mojo throughout that downturn. And I'm kind of seeing the same thing here as maybe some of your old school brick and mortar type companies are leaving and not leasing the space they used to have. All your tech companies, which ironically, most of them are in the like have remote workers or could work in the cloud, um, are leasing the most space in Manhattan itself. But the biggest switch I've seen in the last, say, one to two years and specifically during COVID is repositioning of property. So, for example, if you have an old hotel and hotel business has really been killed in New York, they're repositioning those properties into hybrids of hotel and residential or going fully from a hotel to residential. Um, we're also seeing repositioning in, in some of the suburban markets for malls. So think of a big mall that was anchored by like a Macy's or a Sears or JCPenney. Those are now being bought up by companies such as Netflix and Netflix. And, and, and I don't want to say specifically Netflix, but companies like Netflix or companies that want to lease the Netflix for studio space. And someone else mentioned this on the call a little bit earlier. They're renting some studio space. The studio market is super hot. So whether you're in New Mexico and Albuquerque or, Albuquerque or you're here in New Jersey, that studio space is extremely hot right now. We're seeing a lot of old malls and a lot of old, um, um, let's say, industrial type buildings or, or manufacturing warehouse and type buildings go to studio spaces at this point. So all in all, I say the commercial market is actually a lot hotter than most people think, regardless of what's going on with COVID right now. So. I'm busy. My firm's busy. A lot of my competitors are busy. And uh, we're really hopeful there's actually a tremendous backlog of people in the commercial office space that are just waiting to kind of make a move as they go forward because they've been sitting on the sidelines for the last two years. I talk, I have a broker's license. I don't actively practice any type of brokerage. Um, I don't, I don't uh, lease or sell properties myself as a broker, but talking to a lot of the brokers in the industry, and this is on the commercial side, a lot of these firms just did one or two year um, upticks of their existing leases and they just did renewals and said, you know what, we're just going to sit tight. Nobody's coming into the office right now. Let's just renew our lease for a year and I'll figure out in a year or so what we want to do. Do we want to move to a new space? Um, do we want to actually uh, get a CapEx budget where we want to go spend 200 bucks a square foot to build out a new space for our employees? But more importantly, what does the hybrid space even look like? Is it is it cubicles? Is it benching? Is it uh, more open office type space, flex space. And we were already moving in that direction as an industry anyway. But what does it really look like going forward? And I think that's the million dollar question at this point is what does the office of the future really look like? And I think some of the leading architects and real estate folks out there are still trying to figure that out. And it's going to be iterative as we go forward. We're going to kind of learn what do people really want to do? Do they want to come to the office two days a week, three days a week? I don't think they'll ever really go back five days a week. And then what kind of an office space do we really need? And then the bigger question is, do companies really need as much space as they've had in the past? If they don't, that will certainly hurt the real estate industry. But going back to what I just said, repositioning. I think real estate can always be repositioned to something different, some other type of use case. And that's why I think real estate as an investment is, is one of the best tangible investments in the world. One, as we all know, the old cliche, they're not making any more land. And two, um, the, the, the population continues to grow. So there's always going to be a need for real estate. And, and that's why I like A, working in it and B, investing in it as well. Love that perspective. I think Phil, before I go to you, Brock, had a comment you DM me um, about how you know multifamily is recession proof, and perhaps a lot of real estate can be hitting up on this. And how you you know picked up a lot of units during the pandemic. Can you speak to that? Maybe anything bouncing off of Chris's point of how mm -hmm. you know transferable real estate is from 
uh, you know, commercial to residential to different areas. Uh, yeah, we'd just love to hear your opinion. <laughs> opinion. All right. I want to preface this by saying this. Opinion, of course, is the lowest form of human intelligence, but I'll try to speak from a perspective anyway. Uh, to, to Chris's point about them not making any more land, of course, that's true. In terms of your, what you just said now, with it being recession-proof, by and large, that's, that's, that's largely tr true simply because the business model of shelter is something that you can never disrupt. You can disrupt DVDs and create a Netflix, and you can disrupt CDs and create MP3. You can never disrupt shelter. So for that reason alone, there's always going to be demand. Now, a lot of times people make the conflation of bundling uh, the housing market with the commercial real estate market, basically income producing properties, which is a whole different animal into itself. You have office, retail, hospitality. What I like to stick to is multifamily. One, I'm not intelligent.
to rent VHS. It was like a thing. We go to Blockbuster. And it became DVDs. I remember I had CDs. I would walk around with my little CD player, and it would skip. And it had the mini uh, disc, I think it was called, for $40 you know, to have every three of it. It just wiped out that whole thing, right? There are two, you know, they're, they're susceptible and, and, and vulnerable to, to innovation and disruption. Shelter is not. It's just a form. The form of shelter is where the innovation takes place, whether it's like micro units, co-living, what have you, where you can where you can extrapolate and, and, and create some some nice you can produce some nice premiums on a per on a per per foot basis when it comes to the rent. But overall, you're never going to make people suddenly live in in, in I don't even know what to come up with because in, in like soap bubbles. You know what I mean? It's just not going to happen. So it's as innovation proof, disruption proof, and therefore recession proof as any model that exists. You know, barring some freak, uh, some freak show like the pandemic. Love it, love it. Appreciate that insight there, Philip. Um, and and I, once again, just you know, inspired by what you're doing with your community. And real quick, for anybody that's listening, if you're trying to learn more about real estate or you're trying to learn more about also other areas of finance, because we've also discussed, you know, both commercial and residential. We're talking a little bit about REITs and other areas like that. This are the people. These are the people that you want to be following. So. You know, if you're hanging out with us here tonight, just take a minute, click into their profiles, um, check out what they do. They're definitely worth the follow. We got to get Chris over here to 100K. Um, he's just about there. So keep making sure that, you know, you're following the right people so that you can expand your knowledge and your timeline. And a big shout out to all of you for coming in here for about an hour and a half tonight and trying to, you know, progress upon your knowledge of the industry. To me, you know, real estate something that I, uh, I grew up around, but I never really fully understood. Um, just being transparent, you know, my family, uh, my father got into real estate in 2006 which was pretty rough timing um, and then lost about seven houses in 2008. Um, so, you know, I kind of was shunted. I feel like off of real estate, I, I was really like, you know, that's not for me. That's something where people lose money. Um, Cause that's just what I was kind of growing up around. And now that I've kind of gotten back more into the market and understand the ability to uh, buy in small chunks with what, you know, Phillips letting people do and, or to, you know, go ahead and do that triple, you know, net lease, like Chris talked about earlier, that there is a lot of opportunity here and, you know, to completely disregard it is to you know, disregard a whole entire asset class and everything along those lines. So I would continue to ensure that you're always learning and always putting those forward because there's different types of investing that work for everybody. It's not like everybody's a growth investor or a day trader. It's not like everybody is a long-term investor or, you know, a technical analysis person. But you do have to dabble a little bit into different areas to figure out what is going to work for you and have some skin in the game often really helps. So continue to, you know, listen and interact with these people if this is something that you're interested in. Um, Brock, you, I think, had your hand up beforehand. Uh, before I went to Philip, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to quickly um, give a story to what Chris was saying, and then I don't need to take too much more time here. I've had a lot of the, a lot of the speaking, uh, a lot of the talking stick. But uh, Chris was mentioning that, you know, commercial, uh, and I'm so glad he did because I'm not, I don't know that much about the commercial landscape. But, you know, I'm, I'm recently joined a growing company in New York City and uh, relatively new to the area. And we're, t we're taking over a huge lease for my company. We're taking over a huge lease from some company that uh, I think it's like Macy's or, or Target or something like that, that doesn't need uh, a massive space in, you know, Midtown New York anymore. But it's being, you know, immediately filled by someone that's probably paying even more. And what, but once the space built out super differently. So, you know, I think that kind of like re-tenanting, re-positioning properties thing is, is just, you know, a never finished puzzle. And, uh, you know, Chris saying that hit close to home because we're going through that right now, like rebuilding this, this super corporate office into, into a startup headquarters that, you know, this company might have for a really long time in New York. And so um, not particularly relevant to the other things I was talking about, but uh, Chris definitely was uh, giving some good insight to things that I'd, I'd seen with my own eyes. For sure. Um, so I real quick before I go to you, Wolfie, I did have a question for Ashley that was in mind, which was as you know, I think you mentioned this a little bit earlier, right? There's been such a run up. Do are you expecting a pullback now in this industry? Is there a way that you're hedging perhaps against the pullback? Like what's your mindset? I know I threw that at you at random, Ashley. So. Um, personally, yeah. just because I've worked in the real estate in uh, for a while. Um, oh, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Um, yeah, so just personally from working in the real estate tech industry, um, I feel like um, 
it may not happen as soon as I think, you know, cause I put kind of a, a timeline about six months. Um, but I'd say in the next, you know, if I wanted to extend it, maybe eight to 10 months. Um, and I know that seems kind of, uh, different than what a lot of other people are saying, but I've done real estate analysis, or at least for Texas, I've done it. And, um, you know, like, uh, I, I can't remember who was saying this earlier, um, but they were, you know, the pandemic um, coronavirus thing has caused a lot of uptick in the real estate boom. It's made, um, it's been surprisingly, um, you know, crazy since then. And I feel like it's a very artificial boom rather than something that was very natural to happen. And I feel like um, once things kind of go back to somewhat of a normal thing, I think that the mortgage industries, the rates are going to go up. And I feel like real estate is going to not have this um, boom that we're having now. That's just from what I'm thinking. Um, of course, things are always subject to change, but um, that's just kind of my analysis. Okay. Well, I find that pretty interesting. I think that's perhaps a different take than some others might have. So it's always good to be able to put that out there. And I like how you kind of timelined it a little bit um, for us. So something that uh, definitely we're going to keep an eye on, especially with these rates moving, like you just mentioned. Uh, Wolfie. Yeah, no, I just wanted to touch on something you just briefly mentioned. And I think it's kind of like an important thing. Um, whenever you're investing, it doesn't really matter what it is. The whole I, I heard this from someone who has been in the industry a lot longer than I have and has got a lot more success than I ever will probably. But um, when you're putting together any kind of portfolio or anything, you're basically building something that can kind of withstand the test of time. So I think it's, uh, I think you, you just kind of touched on it. It's like really important to um, have like actual diversification. And I don't mean like have a bunch of different stocks necessarily, but like, real estate will work in situations that other things don't work in and gold will work in some situations and crypto, et cetera. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, nearly as seasoned as everybody else up here, but there are some real advantages from real estate just on a tax basis, for example, um, that a lot of people can benefit from. And so you made that little point and I thought it was really important to emphasize that like, having some sort of balance or like a, a across the board without real estate where you're paying rent every single month and you're not really getting any sort of equity um, kind of sets you back. So I thought it was really kind of a, and I'm, this is coming from someone who's just not like a real estate investor, like everybody else up here. So I just thought it was important to note and just kind of mention. Uh, I often recommend that our clients had a small exposure, even if it was just a few percent, uh, to real estate in their portfolios. Um, and generally, there were, you know, a couple different reasons for that. Obviously, it's, you know, it's an asset class that can be uh, essentially have a different beta to the market or act differently than, it, you know, a typical stocks and other things. But also good points are with, you know, the tax side of things. Um, okay, so it is about an hour. Anybody? Um, so I will move into just oh, a little bit of wrap up. Um, so maybe just some closing points from some of my speakers. And, you know, if there's anything else that's on your horizon, I probably will do another real estate space in the you know near future as, you know, I gain more interest in, well, not necessarily more interest, but more understanding of this industry. Um, and I would like to start with you, Brock. Any, you know, closing remarks, anything else that's, you know, on your radar, anything people should know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks again for hosting. And uh, man, I'm excited about the all the different perspectives we've gotten here. Yeah, I, I think as this space has indicated, um, one of the coolest things about real estate is all the different ways you can get involved. You can have zero dollars and become a wholesaler on the side. You can be a college student that decides or, or, or you know, without even going to college, um, you know, an 18 year old that decides you want to go into this industry and either, you know, in sales and corporate development and partnerships, all kinds of different things you can do, um, commercial or residential. And then from the investing side, there's just an infinite number of niches. You know, I know people that only invest in certain types of homes in college towns in the south. I know people that only invest in, in self-storage. I know people that only invest in, you know, over 200, uh, 
you know, unit house uh, properties in Dallas, Fort Worth, you know, like there, there's just so many different little chunks um, that give different types of exposure to both the national market, um, you know, inflation hedge. I think someone just mentioned uh, tax advantages. Um, and so there's just anyway, there's like an infinite number of ways to get exposure to this industry, either as a professional or as an investor. Um, or even as a spectator, um, people don't seem to enjoy that, you know, looking at all the, all the cool different things that happen. Um, and so, you know, I think it's just, you know, take with a grain of salt, what anyone else says and think about what sort of returns you want to look at. And I guess the last way I'll slice it, which, cause we haven't mentioned it yet is the difference between equity and debt investments. Um, you know, you can, eat, you can buy, um, REITs or funds or, um, you know, different or, or sell commercial, uh, debt or even residential debt, um, and get exposure to that. And you'll just, you'll just get, you know, without doing any work, um, a recurring amount of income every month, basically, um, you'll, you know, you'll own debt. You'll be like a mini bank (laughs) or you can take equity positions, which is most of what we've been talking about where you actually own or own a piece of the real estate. And so, you know, I think it's exciting that there's a few different platforms that people mentioned on here. And another one that I use is Fundrise, where people do get to take kind of like micro equity positions without having to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of, or millions of dollars to, to get involved. So, uh, yeah, my main closing remark is just thanks for coming out here and listening and, you know, happy to connect with anyone that wants to learn more about it. Um, but mainly just think through it for yourself because there's this industry is, you know, one of the biggest in the world. And there's an infinite number of ways that you can uh, get involved in it and participate in it. And it can really make your financial life and maybe your professional life, um, you know, pretty fruitful. Perfect. Thank you so much, Brock. And appreciate you, you know, being the initial person to reach out and suggest this space for the, in the first place. And I'm glad it came together pretty nicely. Ashley, any closing remarks from yourself? Sure. Um, For anybody who follows me, I'm kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, So I don't talk too much about investments or real estate on my profile, but feel free to um, DM me. I just opened my DMs. Um, I have a lot of real estate agent experience. And um, honestly, one of my biggest things is education. Uh, Make sure you know what you're doing before you go into the real estate industry. It's a hard industry to be in. Once you're in, um, you know, it's one of the most rewarding, but you can't just go in blindly. So be sure to stay educated, continue to look at stats all the time, um, eat, breathe them. Um, Don't drown yourself. Get help when you need to. I have a lot of clients all the time that simply hired me because they didn't know how to negotiate. And that's the one thing that people really need to learn how to do, especially in this market, because it would make a difference from you paying $20,000 over the appraisal price to paying $5,000 over the appraisal price. So um, just feel free to reach out if you have any questions about that. And uh, I've really enjoyed being a part of the space. It was a pleasure having you. And definitely, you know, now that Ashley's DMs are open, take advantage of that, everybody. And also, I, real quick before I go to the rest of these speakers, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the reason that I'm able to be on Twitter Spaces pretty much all day, I think I did about five hours today on Twitter Spaces, is because of the Wolf app. So that is the link in my bio, wolf.financial. We're taking, you know, what you see here, this environment right here, where it's a bunch of people discussing and trying to decentralize financial information. Well, Twitter is awesome for that, but it's not built for finance, right? It's built for entertainment and other things. And on the Wolf app, you essentially come in and you have social, but built for finance. You can easily create charts, share them with each other, analyze things together. And soon, very soon, within the next couple of weeks, we're introducing our trading platform as well. So you'll be able to do social research and trading all in one place. Again, it's completely free. We have no charges within the platform. Um, so everything is free to use and to integrate with. So would love to interact with you all on there if you have any accounts. Um, you know, DM me if you make an account. I'm happy to follow you on there and we can interact. And also to sweeten the pot, every single day, if you post on the Wolf app, you're automatically entered into a raffle. We do $25 on the weekdays, $50 on the weekends. We're upping that soon. So literally just for coming on and saying, hey, everybody, what's your thoughts on X stock today? You get entered into a raffle. So it doesn't get much better than that. So we'd appreciate anybody who makes it over there. We've had so many people coming on over the past two weeks. It's been amazing to see. Cool. 
Uh, Chris, we'd love to hear if there's any final thoughts from yourself. Sure. Well, definitely thank you for uh, having me on and hosting this. It was a, a good spot here. Um, I think I've kind of said everything I want to say. The, the three key things I'd focus on from a real estate perspective that it, it does for anyone that wants to get invested in is, number one, it, it appreciates your wealth. It's a tangible asset that kind of can help you appreciate that wealth over time. It's not guaranteed, just like any investment out there. Nothing is guaranteed out there. Um, but as you're appreciating that wealth, you can also use the leverage, the leverage and using the debt within your properties or the equity in your properties to kind of expand upon your overall portfolio and increase that wealth over over time. Um, but even more importantly, and what's most important to me, it's why I kind of navigate more towards the triple net lease properties now, is it produces income. I want that income producing property, that passive income where I know, regardless of whatever happens in my, my work life or my other investments in my life, that that income is going to be coming in. And again, it's not guaranteed, but as you build a portfolio of, of a number of different triple net lease properties or any properties, whether it be residential, commercial, industrial, multifamily, is that maybe one or two of them might have some issues or go wrong at any given time. But if you have a nice structured balanced portfolio built up, you'll have income. So when you wake up every morning, you know that you're not going to be put out in the street because you have that income. And it's it's what real estate gives an investor over the course of the life. And I think the last thing I say is I have a couple of kids. So I have a son and I have a daughter. Um, it's a lesson legacy. I can teach them to kind of get in the business as well. And it's something I can hand down to them in my will as I kind of move on and and they kind of live their lives and have their children as well. So that that's why I love real estate. And And, and definitely thank you for having me on today. Yeah, very well said. And, you know, again, I'll reiterate it to everybody that Chris is just a master with this type of stuff, has been doing it clearly for a long time and is a great follow if you are seriously interested in becoming, you know, part of this community. But also if you love the investing side of things, long term investing, um, definitely. I know that I'm pretty sure you lean towards that, but also some short term stuff. Um, highly recommend Chris as well. So appreciate you, you coming on. Uh, yes, sir. OK, uh, Philip. Any uh, any parting remarks? Anything else? And any anything else coming up with uh, Nice that you would want us to know about? Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. I was just making sure. Uh, well, number one, thank you for inviting me. I have done exactly one clubhouse, which is a similar format to this in my life. I've categorically refused to do them. So, uh, thank you for uh, bringing this to my attention and allowing me to do so. Uh, secondly, I was just hammer, hammer home the point that if anybody's interested in doing any real estate investing, the barrier to entry is not as is not as great as one might think. It's literally just just a matter of saving up enough for the three and a half percent, living in one unit, living rent free, and and renting them out, and you're started as a real estate investor. It is, if this is indeed your thing. Overall, the larger point, though, uh, however, is that because of the rampaging, raging inflation that we see right now. Typically, I would I would always uh, <laughs> I like people to invest, for, for instance, in municipal bonds because you get tax free yield is relatively high. And what is what are the odds that a government is going to collapse? But in, a, in an environment of inflation, not so good of an idea. The equity market is where it's at, whether it's the stock market, the broader stock market, like index funds or real estate, because it's a tangible asset. And all that stuff is tied to inflation as inflation goes. So do those things like rent will go up. Coffee will go up, everything will go up, and so will the values and the prices and so on and so forth. So I'll just hammer home the point that people need to start investing. Whatever they want to invest in, or whatever they're interested in, they need to invest because they can't afford not to. It sits in your account, it gets you eroded and eaten alive by inflation. And secondly, if if indeed real estate is your thing, is not as it doesn't present as great a barrier to entry as one might think. And if you guys want to learn more, just hit me up, DM me, write me. Hit me up inside our tribe, which is our, uh, which is nicest community, or just check out our app if you want to own spectacular cash flow in real estate at like a hundred dollars. So uh, that's all for me. Oh, by the way, one comment. I see this one guy listening who's an investor in the soccer team in my home country. So shout out to you. I'm, I'm a Danish guy and he owns a Danish club. I just, I'm just seeing it right here. So that's pretty cool. But anyways, uh, that's all for me, Gab. I'm out. Awesome. Appreciate you, Philip. Take care, man. I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. And Wolfie. Yeah, I really appreciate it. This is like uh, one of the kinds of spaces where I'm more of a like a listener and, and taking notes and kind of absorbing. So I appreciate uh, giving me the opportunity to be a part of it. Um, I, from my perspective, want to see how interest rates materialize and like what kind of impact that'll have on an equity side and on a behavioral side. So, um, you know, moving forward in the next couple of months, I want to see if, you know, tapering actually has material impact on rates and if those 
uh, rate impacts will have residual through high growth. Uh, in, in we, like, uh, I don't remember who it was, but someone mentioned it uh, specifically with like Zillow and uh, some of the, the turmoil that they've seen uh, without having the taper, without having the, the rate stuff. So like it could be somewhat of a little bit of a cocktail from an anecdotal, anecdotal perspective. Uh, I was unfortunate enough to uh, build my first home in the last year and I saw it as well. You're paying like two and a half, three X for materials and labor, um, specifically labor. Uh, this was really, really difficult. Um, so I, I kind of want to see those things. Um, if those things do materialize that way, I want to see how a lot of the large scale uh, rental REITs perform. So just think of things like Essex, for example. And then I want to see, I want to stay in like safe, um, grow regardless of uh, certain types of activities. So like American Tower is a decent uh, example uh, as 5G grows and as, you know, we, we need more um, cell usage, cell towers will be a thing. And then lastly, if it were to materialize that way, one of the things that's happening is we're having shortages across the board, uh, like it's like been reiterated over and over again, materials, labor, et cetera. And um, with that, a lot of people are, are starting to uh, store a lot of their stuff. So like if I, if I sold my home, for example, I don't really have a place to go. Um, so, or with the work from home environment and I accumulated a bunch of stuff, I need to store it somewhere. So PSA is one that I'm looking at there. Uh, so those are like some of the bullet points that I'm looking at in terms of just like an equity investor side, et cetera. Uh, and yeah, thanks, Gav. Thanks everybody for your time. Appreciate it. Learned a lot. Really, really admire some of the things that have been said on here. Well, it's great to have people who are, you know, well versed in other industries. For myself, learning in every one of these spaces. This was a huge research myself, and I be able to get a whole two people. Gab, you're robocopping again. All right. Well, thanks for having us. We'll see if uh, he's able to sort that out, but <laughs> I'll talk to you guys all later. Thank you. Yeah. It's still no good. To anybody that's on my space that can still hear me, if you're listening, is it still bad, Philip? You're good. You're good now. No, you're, good you now. Reverted you're much clarity. better now. All right. Clarity. Cool. Cool. Okay. So my service is like trash. So no worries. It's T-Mobile. It's good times. Okay. So just as I was saying, if you enjoyed spaces like this, there are many more like this to come. I still have four more this week. So I have two tomorrow. I'm going to have one at 3 p.m. EST. That's going to be a massive space. We're going to be working with Captain Solutions. They do social sentiment analyzation. And then I have like a full panel, which I totally may have overbooked, but you'll have plenty of amazing minds that'll be there to analyze their stocks from technical and fundamental perspectives. So that's going on at 3 and then at 6 p.m. or 5, 5 p.m. EST. So literally right after that one. I'm going to do one with Ashley, I think. You'll be on there and some others, and we're going to do an NFT space. And then on Friday, I'm going to have two spaces as well, one at 12, one at 4, and I'm sure I'll book like 10 for next week. Even though I'm traveling, I will try my best to make it happen. If you enjoyed these, you know, make sure that you're following my speakers. We'd love to have your follow as well. Um, the growth on this account has been amazing to see. People clearly love having free decentralized information. And again, if you want to be added to my spaces calendar so you never miss one, just send me your email over the DMs, say you want to be added to the calendar, and I'd be happy to add you to the free public.